Good morning. Welcome to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane. I'm Karen Barry Schwartz, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane can be heard here on Relevant Radio on 1410 AM and 106.7 FM in Fort Myers and 1660 AM and 93.3 FM in Naples on the last Friday of every month at 8.30 a.m. or anytime at dioceseofvenice.org slash Our Bishop. Your Excellency Bishop Duane, welcome back to Relevant Radio. Karen, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back with you and our listeners. Bishop, next week on Friday, we will be celebrating the Solemnity of All Saints on November 1st, a holy day of obligation, followed by the Feast of All Souls on the next day, November 2nd. Of course, the month of November is known as the month of all souls in the church. Perhaps you'd like to begin today with a prayer dedicated to those souls who have gone before us, all the faithful departed. Good idea. So let's do that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In your hands, O Lord, we humbly entrust our brothers and sisters. In this life, you embrace them with your tender love. Deliver them now from every evil and bid them eternal rest. The old order has passed away. Welcome them into paradise, where there will be no sorrow, no weeping or pain, but fullness of peace and joy with your Son and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bishop. Of course, we are always mindful of and praying for those we have loved who have gone before us. I often think of my own parents. But at this time, there is a special remembrance in the church, and we're going to be talking about saints and souls this morning. Bishop Duane and I are blessed this morning to be joined by Father John Belmonte, Society of Jesuits, who is the Diocese of Venice Superintendent of Catholic Education, and Jim Gontis, the Director of Evangelization here at the Diocese. Welcome to you both, and thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Karen. Good to be thank here. Thank you. Bishop, All Saints Day, next Friday, November 1st, is a solemnity and a holy day of obligation in the Catholic Church. Why is this day so important in the Church? Well, I think we hearken back to those men and women who lived particularly good lives, if I could use that value-loaded word. But they lived according to the teachings of Jesus Christ, is the important point there. And in many cases, there's witnesses to the extraordinary life that they lived. So on November 1st, it's a solemnity and a holy day of obligation in the Catholic Church, as you noted. It really is a day to thank the saints for their service, their dedication, for the example that they give to us, having come before us. Many well-known saints have their own commemorative days that we know on a particular day in the year. Not all do. Some maybe had a day years ago, and they're not so well-known now, and they've kind of slide off the, the calendar. But on this day, we hearken back to all of them. It is a time to remember the role that saints play in salvation and can play for us. Particularly Christianity has always held up saints as a way that we should live our lives. So I think it is a time to remember the role that these men and women played in their society and their families in a culture of the day. And they gave particular witness to the Lord. We need to follow those footsteps and strive to do the same. What about the criticism? I, I know I hear this now and then, I'm sure as priests and director of evangelization, you all do, that the criticism that Catholics worship the saints. We know this isn't true, but we hear that sometimes. What is that all about? People think we worship the saints. You're looking at me, so I'm going to go first, but then I'll turn it over <laughs> to these other two right away. We ask the saints to intercede on our behalf due to the good lives they've lived, due to the recognition of their spiritual strength, powers, if you want, to intercede with the Lord, to ask him to give us the grace we need to live sometimes in very difficult situations. So it isn't as though we're worshiping the saints, but we do call to mind that we ask them. Today I was at one of our schools. I meet with the eighth graders and they can ask any questions. And one young man stood up and He wanted to know what my favorite saints were. I thought, okay, there's the opportunity to explain that concept now. Why do you ask me about my favorite saints? What difference does it make? Aren't they all good, whether they're my favorite or not? And the thing is, 
I think we do have men and women who have come before us in the church who are examples. And maybe, too, we have a grandparent who we just think they are a saint. Church never declared them that, but they were strong people of faith. And that strikes us. This young man listened to my response. I had the opportunity of meeting Mother Teresa in my life and John Paul II. He said, oh, that's cool. You met saints. (laughs) Okay, it is different. But for me also, like St. Gregory, major saint that I'll pray to, Pope Gregory the Great, did a lot of very positive changes in the church. Just, I think, a strong man of faith, and he wasn't afraid to live it or talk about it. Well, I will say, first of all, that, of course, we just celebrated the feast day of St. John Paul II, who you mentioned, Bishop. I will say, just a a brief comment, I'm surprised that you didn't include St. Patrick in your list of, of saints. Maybe you did. I left it for you. Okay. Being from Chicago, we learned that St. Patrick was the fourth person of the Most Holy Trinity, but (laughs) I digress. I digress. So I think it's an important point to say that we don't worship the saints. I like to connect this back to the Eucharist, right? And so at every Mass, we remember our beloved dead and we remember the saints. And so in that moment, that sacred moment, the saints who intercede for us in heaven are also with those who have gone before us in the faith, praying for us. We pray for them, they pray for us, and so we're united in that most sacred and most important moment. And so it's us worshiping God, but venerating the saints in their own holiness, and then also asking for the intercession for our own needs. So it really comes together at the Mass in in beautiful ways, and so important to recognize the saints in those moments, important to recognize all the apostles, all the great saints of the church. And so that is the church truly praying together, united with heaven. That emphasizes the importance of worship and prayer, but it's veneration, Mm -hmm. not worshiping the saints. I think that's obviously an important distinction, but we do hear that sometimes. I know you must as well. Jim, I'd like to get you in here. I know before the show, we were talking about saints as intercessors and modelers. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. That's It's interesting when the church in some of her official documents is talking about the canonized saints in particular, uh, two words keep coming out, intercessors and models. Models to show us how to live and powerful prayers for us. We ask people, people of all kinds of different faiths, ask people in this world to pray for them. So why not ask God's Hall of Famers, if you will, Mm -hmm. to pray for us? As Father said, we worship God alone, but these are people, the saints, who followed God in a very special and powerful way, which is why we give them due honor. Again, not worship, which we give to God alone, but due honor. And they come in all different races and ethnicities, Boys, girls, men, women, different personality types, quiet ones, loud ones. So there's saints for every occasion and every person. I love that. Bishop, you mentioned something interesting about recognizing the role that the saints play in our salvation. Let's talk a little bit more about that. I know that you've said that the angels and the saints cooperate in God's design for our salvation. I think Pope Francis has spoken recently on this, if I'm not mistaken. And he's talked about the fact that the saints and the angels accompany us on the salvific path that we strive to take. He particularly addressed a lot about the angels when he made that statement, if I'm recalling Mm -hmm. it correctly, where he talked about the archangels. And he says that, you know, Michael fights against the devil. Gabriel bears the good news to all of us that we need to hear. And St. Raphael, well, he walks with us, helping us not to make a mistake along the journey. Maybe it's a mistake in our step. Maybe it's in what we say or how we do it. But the Holy Father has put, I think in some ways he's brought, and I know we're talking about saints, but he's brought angels back into the picture, both as the archangels and as guardian angels that we have. And he talks about it maybe a lot more than we heard in recent years, maybe before him. But I think it's a good thing. Really, these saints and angels serve God by accompanying all people, the Holy Father says, on that path of salvation. So they continue, even though we've canonized them as saints, to live their life, but they're serving the Lord in that capacity. It's not just us. In the end, they do, but it's not merely us they serve. They continue to serve God. We don't think about it. It's like they made it. 
but I got to serve God. No, he's saying that they continue to serve the Lord, and that task and how they do it is helping us. Are angels saints, and are saints angels? What's the difference? Jim, I know you do a talk, angels and demons. You know a lot about angels. So the ones who were obedient to God in their time of testing are saints in the sense that saint comes from the Latin sanctus, which simply means holy. So they're among the holy ones. That's why we can say Saint Michael the Archangel or Saint Raphael or Saint Gabriel. And those are the only three whose names we know with certainty from Scripture. They all have names. One day we'll probably know them, but those are the ones that we know right now. Bishop, I just read that Pope Francis just canonized 14 new saints earlier this week. Yes, he did. As I recall, there were 11 who had been crucified at an earlier time, the Christians very devoted in their faith, and the others were female superiors of religious communities. There were three of them, if I'm not mistaken. We've seen in different parts of the world lately that individuals, we saw it on television, videos of shot because they refused to convert to another faith. They kept their Christian faith alive. And some of these have included Franciscan friars. Others were laymen who just lived a very good life. And they were attacked, particularly those 11 in Damascus, in one of the quarters, during kind of a a wave of religious violence by Muslims against the Christians at that time. Of course, religious violence, sadly, continues in our world, and we hear a lot about it, far too much, I think, in different parts of the world. So I think the Holy Father reached back in a very clever way a little bit to give some martyrs of the past, but to give individuals of today a confirmation that they're standing up. He gives them encouragement, stand up for the faith, and not to be afraid. And as you pointed out, those people were from some time ago, I think 1860 or something. So it takes a long time to become a saint. In a minute, we're going to talk about someone who maybe it didn't take that long for. You are listening to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane on Relevant Radio. I'm Karen Barry Schwartz, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane can be heard anytime at relevantradio.com and on the last Friday of each month at 8.30 a.m. on 1410 a.m and 106.7 FM in Fort Myers, and 1660 AM and 93.3 FM in Naples, or anytime at dioceseofvenice.org slash ourbishop. Bishop and Father and Jim, much has been said also about the recent canonization of Carlos Acutis, who has been recognized as a saint by Pope Francis, and whose official canonization ceremony will take place next year. Carlos Acutis, has been called God's influencer and the patron saint of the internet, and he will be the world's first millennial saint. Do you think this will have a positive effect on Catholic youth, drawing them closer to the church when they can see themselves maybe in Carlos? Father, maybe that's a good one for you. Absolutely, yes. Of course, it'll have a very positive influence for young people, already has. Of course, he was beatified in 2020, just 14 years after his death from leukemia. And so he's a perfectly contemporary young person who's known as God's influencer and was very influential as a website designer as a young man. So at age 14, he began to catalog and design a website to catalog Eucharistic miracles and Marian apparitions. And so his two great devotions were to, of course, Our Lady and Our Lord and the Most Holy Eucharist. Through his parish and his parish priest, he was able to design this website. I will add, just as a little aside, is that he was a student at the Jesuit school in Milan. And so as a Jesuit, we are proud to claim him as one of our own. Absolutely. Just thought I'd throw that in. Thank you, Father, for throwing that in. You're welcome. (laughs) And no extra charge. (laughs) So, so yes, so he's a great example of someone who loved God, loved our Lord, loved our Lady, the Church. He also has a connection to Assisi. I'm not sure if people are aware of that. He's buried in Assisi because he asked to be buried in Assisi due to his devotion to St. Francis of Assisi. And so even the theme of our show today of how we want to be devoted to the saints is exemplified by this young man who is so devoted to St. Francis of Assisi that he asked to be buried in Assisi, and he's actually buried there in his tomb, being oh, visit wow. his tomb. Yeah. 
So many uh, beautiful things that uh, we can learn from the devotional life of soon-to-be San Carlo. He was not canonized at the last canonization last Sunday, but that date will be set out a little bit further into the future because I think Pope Francis wanted to focus on, on him in particular. So yeah, so a beautiful example and something that I think young people can very easily respond to. Absolutely. I mean, how amazing for them to have a contemporary to look toward as being a saint. I know, Father, you are always fond of telling all the students anyone can be a saint. That's it. So we, uh, that we have an example uh, with him, and he's also, you know, the beautiful thing is he's a Catholic school student. Yeah. Went to Catholic schools and had his faith nourished in Catholic schools and Catholic education. So, Father, you, every year with the Catholic schools here in the Diocese of Venice, you have a devotional project. Yes. And I believe your project this year has to do with angels and archangels. Can you tell us a little yes. bit about that? Every year I meet with Bishop Duane and uh, talk about what a sort of emphasis we can place on the devotional life of the church to introduce and sometimes reintroduce uh, students to devotions. And so when I started, Bishop had initiated the year dedicated to St. Joseph. And so the young people, the, the students in our Catholic schools learn about St. Joseph. And what we do is we have each school and each principal select two students, one boy and one girl, eighth graders, to be junior catechists. My curriculum director, Jennifer Falstini, creates a lesson about that particular devotion that the eighth graders can then teach to their classmates. We gather them together in the diocese, usually at the cathedral, to do a training session. The students are trained to teach the lesson, and then they spend part of the school year going classroom to classroom to teach their classmates about the particular devotion. And so each year changes. St. Joseph, one year we did devotion to the Blessed Mother, and this year after meeting with Bishop Duane, we're going to focus on angels and archangels. And so we're bringing the students together for that. And in my experience anyway, they love the angels. And so I think this is going to be very popular. We cap the year with a mass toward the end of the school year. If bishop's available, he comes for the mass. And then we also have an art contest where students recreate artwork based on the devotion. And so this year we'll do artwork based on, on the angels, and they create a beautiful piece of artwork. I get hundreds and hundreds of submissions from our students. And then we have to, unfortunately, select seven. When I started, I thought I was going to be able to get away with one selection, but I've wimped out and picked seven now. So, uh, so we have seven winners each year. And just a beautiful example of faith and the way the children respond to the devotions in the church. I want to add one dimension, this adding on to your story, because you do it. You take those pictures, then you make holy cards out of them, don't you? And then we make holy cards You put cards a prayer on the other side. Yep. Usually it's a beautiful prayer. And for young people that age, I don't think we spend enough time. You know, there's an angel now, and you're going to have a prayer to an angel on the other side. They write some of them. The artwork is there. It's really moving. I usually take it to like whether it's my diocesan council, even the finance council, and hand them out and just say these are ones to. They're always so impressed. They did this. They wrote this. They drew these. I love and it. We just hand the them. The artwork out. is unbelievable. Yeah, it's beautiful. I, you get uh, you know, second graders doing these yeah. beautiful pieces of our work. And Certainly then, better than I and could then do. They, oh, I couldn't very do it. Impressive. We give the students who won the contest and have their artwork on the holy cards, we give them a stack of holy cards. And I witnessed one of them a couple of years ago who immediately had to share his holy cards with his uh, other students. So he's walking around very proudly <laughs> trading his holy cards with the other kids. So, Well, that's good if we can make them like baseball cards. And <laughs> trade the saints, you know? You know? Trade I'll the trade saints. you two St. Joseph's for one uh, <laughs> one uh, holy blessed hey, mother. It could, work. Angel. Yes. it could work. Yeah. Before we run out of time here today, I do also want to talk about the Feast of All Souls, which is a separate day in the church, but they happen to follow each other, all saints and all souls, one after the other. November 2nd is the Feast of All Souls. And Jim, you and I were talking, it's not really technically a feast day in the church. Let's talk a little bit about All Souls. Thank you, Karen. It's called a commemoration, the commemoration of All Souls. And we are remembering our beloved dead. And in a special way, those who are in purgatory. Now, sometimes some of our brothers and sisters in Christ will say, well, the word purgatory isn't in the Bible. Sometimes the church coins terms to get across powerful realities. 
In fact, all Christians believe in the Trinity. The church coined that term, tri-unity, a contraction to get to the three in one. But it is a biblical concept but with biblical backing. We see it in the Old Testament. In 2 Maccabees, we hear about cleansing fires in, in Malachi and Isaiah and in 1 Corinthians and 1 Peter. So everyone who's in purgatory, and a lot of people, I think, when talking about purgatory or, or thinking about it, maybe think of it as a middle place between heaven and hell. It's not. It's the vestibule to heaven. It's the front porch to the mansion to use an analogy. Their salvation, those who are in purgatory, is guaranteed. They died in a state of, here's that word, sanctifying, holy making grace. And so they died in a state of holiness, but they still need some of the dross cleansed and to be perfectly purified. They wouldn't even feel right going into heaven until that's taken care of. So it really is a teaching and a reality of both God's justice and mercy. And our prayers can help them to get to heaven sooner. They can pray for us, but they can't pray for themselves. So it's the doctrine, really, of the communion of saints. Those in heaven already praying for us and those in purgatory, we praying for those who are in purgatory and on earth, and those in purgatory praying for us. So this beautiful exchange of spiritual goods among those in heaven and in purgatory and here on earth. I think this concept is, is so interesting as a layperson. I know Bishop and I have talked, a lot of people are like, what, what is purgatory? Does that anyone yeah. even know what that is anymore? I know as a child, I thought it was terrifying. <laughs> purgatory okay. seems so scary. But the notion that people in purgatory are being prayed for by people on earth, it gives you the message that you need to have an impact on the people around you on earth, right? I mean, who's going to pray for you if you're in purgatory otherwise? So... You need to leave your mark here on others that they might remember you. Sometimes we forget at every Mass we go to, we pray for the souls of those who have died before us. Mm -hmm. It's in every Mass where we talk about those who have fallen asleep in the Lord. And the priest always presents that. And sometimes we pause and let the congregation, let individuals recall whoever it might be. I think sometimes that slips by people. You know, they're very, they hear it over and over again. They don't think of it. But it is an important time. And that idea that this communion of saints, as I noted earlier, the saints serve the Lord by praying for people. So it's there. We need to also think about, well, we can pray for people that are in purgatory, that we want to advance them to life with the Lord. And they will take care of us when they are in heaven following us along. So that idea, I think we are closer to it. Some people say, oh, I don't like that idea of All Souls Day. You know, you have to think about dying. Well, we should do that every day, every time we say the Mass, every time we participate in it. Yeah. Let's face it, death is a natural part of living. Yeah, I remember one time I went to a funeral and I thought the priest did such a good job. He said, well, here we are. This is the hardest thing God asks of us to give someone back. And Mm -hmm. I thought that was such a nice way to put it. You know, it really stuck with me. As Bishop points out, Catholic and Christians, really, the connection with the dead is very close and very tight and is part of our Mass. Father Belmonte, I know you have a wonderful story about a child who has saved a million souls. Yes. Would you share that with us? I like to teach the children the devotion of St. Gertrude the Great for the Holy Souls in Purgatory. St. Gertrude the Great was a medieval saint an abbess who had a vision of our Lord who told her that if anyone would pray this prayer that he taught her, a thousand souls would be saved from purgatory. So I introduced this devotion to the students, as we do every year with devotions to the students. And I was visiting a Catholic school a few years ago, and the teacher pulled me aside and she said, I want you to talk to Andrew. And so she pulled Andrew. She said, Andrew, show Father your notebook. And so he showed me his notebook, and he had these hash marks, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, all on this page. And she said, tell Father what those hash marks are. And Andrew said, oh, those are the number of times that I've prayed the St. Gertrude prayer. And so we did a quick calculation, and if a thousand souls were saved from purgatory because of Andrew's prayers, I said, Andrew, congratulations, this page represents one million souls saved from purgatory just by you. And he said, well, I only prayed it 
during recess and lunch, never during class. <laughs> he had to say that in front of his teacher. He right? made sure he wasn't going to get in trouble. But yes, a million souls. So children, they love it. They respond to these sorts of things. And this is just a reminder to us, as I like to say at funerals, that our church is a holy mother and she never forgets her beloved dead. So we pray for our beloved dead at every Mass, every time there's any Mass, anywhere in the world, any hour during the day, any place in the world, we always remember our beloved dead. And this prayer, this prayer of St. Gertrude for the holy souls in purgatory, is just another example that we always remember our beloved dead. And so we're never forgotten. We're never forgotten because our mother would never forget us. I went to a Catholic grade school when I was growing up, and on All Souls Day, the teacher, the nun in the classroom would always tell us that today we had to, she would prep us the day before, but she'd remind us, during recess, you have to go into church and, and lunchtime and pray. But you went in and prayed for somebody and you had to come outside. And then you go back in and you pray for somebody else. Mm. There had to be separate visits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, this is Sister mm -hmm. Cabrini taught mm -hmm. us that. God bless her. They had to be separate <laughs> visits. After a while, I was like, why do we have to keep running in and out? Mm -hmm. You know, because Wisconsin was already cold by then. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but I think a lot of people still, is, you know, like to visit a cemetery on that day. I think these are some of the traditions, at least when I was young, grew up, you did. You were aware of it, certainly recite a prayer for the dead, mm -hmm. as your student did, attend a particular Mass on that day. And as kids, you know, we'd be told, you know, think of all the relatives in your family who have died, mm -hmm. and you want to pray for them now. And uh, I think it was a good, a good way to understand that that death is part of life, and there's other generations to come after. Absolutely. And these, you know, very connected, but also separate days, I think we have to remember we were inspired by the saints. And we all should be striving for sainthood, as Father Belmonte likes to tell our students. And at the same time, both of these days encourage us to trust in God's abundant mercy and his great desire really for us to be with him in eternity. Before we close, Father Belmonte, I wonder if you would share with us the St. Gertrude prayer for the souls in purgatory. I would be honored. This prayer was given to the church by St. Gertrude. And our Lord promised that following this prayer, he would release a thousand souls from purgatory. And so we have accomplished something this morning. So let's pray in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer thee the most precious blood of thy divine Son, Jesus, in union with the masses said throughout the world today. For all the holy souls in purgatory, for sinners everywhere, for sinners in the universal church, and those in my own home and within my family, Amen. St. Gertrude the Great, pray for, pray us. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you. I think that's about all the time we have for this morning. I'd like to thank you for listening, and also thank our host, Bishop Frank J. Duane, and our guests, Father John Belmonte, Society of Jesuits, and Superintendent of Catholic Education for the Diocese of Venice, and Jim Gontis, Director of Evangelization for the Diocese, whom we were blessed to have with us today. Thank you all for the great discussion and information and your insightful commentary this morning. Before we sign off today, uh, we are very close to an election. It's just coming up in a couple of weeks on Tuesday, November 5th. And as a reminder, I'd like to share once again that all Catholics and indeed all Floridians are encouraged to vote no on Amendments 3 and 4. Amendment 3, if passed, would legalize the recreational use of marijuana in the state of Florida, encouraging its use and paving the way for adverse health outcomes and worse. Amendment 4 would enshrine the right to an abortion at any time for any reason in our state constitution, including when the baby can feel pain and through the final months of pregnancy. It is an extreme pro-abortion amendment that must be stopped. Please vote no on Amendments 3 and Amendment 4. We will be back at the end of November. Stay tuned and thank you for listening. Good morning and God bless. You have been listening to Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane. I'm Karen Barry Schwartz, Director of Communications for the Diocese of Venice in Florida. Witnessing Faith with Bishop Duane can be heard here on Relevant Radio on 1410 AM and 106.7 FM in Fort Myers and 1660 AM and 93.3 FM in Naples on the last Friday of every month at 8.30 a.m. or anytime at dioceseofvenice.org slash ourbishop.